Today, we're going to look at cross products. I knew eventually I would be able to get to this. Uh, we want to talk about what the cross product is telling us and how to calculate the cross product. We're going to go in the other order than we've been going with the other operations because what it tells us is much more interesting than how to calculate it, which is kind of ugh, awful. So what it tells us, this is the important thing. U cross V is a vector perpendicular to U and V. When you find the cross product of two vectors, you get a vector that is perpendicular or orthogonal to both vectors. Here's why we care about that. We can describe a plane as the span of two non-collinear vectors, a plane is the span of two non-collinear vectors. I've gone and used a linear algebra word. I've used the word span. This means the linear, any, uh, every linear combination. The span of a set of vectors is the set of all possible linear combinations. So span is every linear combination. Non-collinear. A plane is every linear combination of two vectors. That's what makes a plane. R2 is the span of I and J. That is, every vector in R2 is a unique linear combination of the vectors 1, 0, and 0, 1. So one way we describe a plane is by saying it's the span, every possible linear combination of two non-collinear vectors. Any two non-collinear lines define plane. Yes. Uh, that's why I keep bringing up the non-collinear bit. But yeah, if we've got two vectors in R3, we are talking about if we just take every combination of those, we get a plane. If the vectors are collinear, then we're only going to get a line because we're not going to be able to make 
two linearly independent vectors. But then we have to think about linear independence and things get messier. So I retreat to the fact that we're in R3 because this is just tau three. And so we don't have to go with more than two. But a plane is the span of two vectors. Recall also that we can describe a plane as everything perpendicular to one vector. We can describe a plane in R3 A plane in R3, we can also describe as everything that's perpendicular to one vector. Everything orthogonal to one vector that we call the normal vector. So if we have a plane in R3, we could describe this plane using two vectors. Or we can describe this plane as everything perpendicular to one normal vector. And we've seen this happen before. When we talk about the equation for this plane in R3, the coefficients in standard form will be the components of our normal vector. Standard form. The coefficients of x, y, and z in the standard form for the equation of this plane will be the components of the normal vector. We're describing this plane as everything perpendicular to the normal vector. So if I have some vector that's coming straight out the page, I could say it's everything perpendicular to this pen, which would be the plane containing the paper. If I have the vector going this way, I can define a plane as everything perpendicular to the pen. And so it'd be this plane here. And then the cross product comes along. And if we have any two vectors, the cross product of those two vectors will tell us a vector perpendicular or orthogonal to both of those vectors. So if we can think of those two vectors being in a plane, 
the cross product of those two vectors will tell us what's normal to that plane. This is useful if we think back in terms of calculus. One of the things that we want to describe in terms of calculus, uh, if we go back to our discussion of the calculus thing, one of the questions that we want to ask in Calc 3 with multivariable calculus is what is the equation of a plane tangent to a surface at a given point? And we want to be able to describe that plane with one vector. In the same way, we describe direction with the derivative. So we're going to take two vectors, the rate of change in the x direction, the rate of change in the y direction, and we're also going to think about what the normal vector is at that point, what's perpendicular to the surface. Any questions? This does require that we have a plane in R3, because now we're using two dimensions up for the plane and one dimension up for the vector perpendicular to that plane. If I am in R4, then I can have two dimensions for a plane, then perpendicular to that plane will be two more dimensions. So I'll have a whole other plane. So it'll be a little different. And if I just pick one vector, that's using up one dimension. I have three dimensions that would be perpendicular to that one dimension. So if I'm in R4, I don't have a normal vector to a plane. I'll have a normal vector to a three-dimensional subspace of that R4. Any questions? It's hard to picture things in R4 and R5, and that movie interstellar sure did not help them. This seems more colorful. And Matthew McConaughey was there. That, that was him, right? I'm not making those things up. Like, was it Matthew McConaughey? All right. Matthew McConaughey. All right. Anyway. They always have like movies like that and it's like always about something else. Do you know what I mean? It's like I have like so here's the thing. Here, here's what happens. Some of you, I don't know if any of you are going to go into math, some of you become mathematicians, get advanced degrees in math and all that stuff. Weird stuff happens to you when you get an advanced degree in math. First of all, every time a movie that is even tangentially related to math, everybody just assumes that I've seen it. Oh, you must have seen Goodwill Hunting. It's like, oh, no, I haven't. Why do you think I would have seen that? Well, because you're a mathematician and there's a mathematician in it. I'm like, oh, how much is that movie about math? No, I know it's zero about math, and it's about the young man's struggles with dealing with life. That's what it's about. It's about the character, not about the math. It could have been any other subject. The only part of Goodwill Hunting I looked up was what was the problem? Because you got to pick a very good problem to be difficult for people to, to, to figure out that's believable, that people can figure it out but also figure outable by someone just by reading books. Because if it was like the Riemann hypothesis or some shit like that, and it was just written up on the board in notation, I'm sorry, but you kind of have to be in the culture to understand what the F is going on, right? Because everybody has seen, of course, the Riemann zeta function, right? See, it wouldn't help if you just written on the board, right? It's just, there's so much culture that you kind of absorb by being in these academic spaces. I'm not saying that this is a superior way of doing things. It has great many flaws, but there are some things that's just really hard to figure out by reading from books. That's why, that's the genius of this particular movie that I haven't seen, is that they picked a problem that was super accessible. You just read about the problem and there it is. So it actually makes sense. Now, the problem itself, as far as solving it goes, does everybody remember the problem from Goodwill Hunting? Once again, that's why it doesn't matter. The movie's not about math. If the movie was about math and you watch Goodwill Hunting, even if it was like your favorite movie or some shit, 
And you're like, oh yeah, I remember that problem. But you don't remember the problem. You remember the struggles of the young man dealing with his own mind. That's what it's about. The problem had like lines and dots, right? That's like the most people remember about the problem. So um, I can't remember the whole problem, but it's uh, look up the problem and it's not hard to come up to do. It's not a hard problem to deal with. Now, so when, when he said, oh, mathematicians have not uh, been able to answer this question, uh, Goodwill Hunting did not answer the question either. He just drew the 10 things. Just drew the 10 things. We all could do that. I've done it to see if I could. But prove that those are the only 10 things. That's the hard part. Does that make sense? It's a pretty dope problem. Everybody's on their computer looking at it up right, looking it up right now. <laughs> this is how I can like gloss over the cross product and no one misses, and I can avoid doing calculations. But that's the important part. It's a vehicle for telling a bigger story, a more accessible story. The movie was not successful because the mathematician. The movie was successful because it told the mathematician's story. There's also the Russell Crowe one. A beautiful mind, thank you. Um, it does touch on his great ideas, but it was more a movie about um, about Nash dealing with his uh, uh, dealing with his mental trauma. Anyway. I, side note, my favorite thing about Nash is that he says that his conclusion is essentially competition is wrecking things. That, that's like me editorializing that conclusion. But the idea is that competition can make things worse. To the point where like, oh, yeah, competition in many cases will be inferior, inferior to cooperation. Yes, we should do cooperation. It will be more efficient than competition. That's such a great idea. Here's a Nobel Prize. Oh, so are we going to cooperate more? No, fuck that. We're going to do more competition. Then what's the Nobel Prize for? We're idiots is what I'm saying, like, collectively. But anyway, what are we talking about? This is what happens when you're in my class. I get distracted easily. And I don't edit this shit out of the, because then the video is only like a minute long. So important thing about cross product. You got two vectors, their cross product will be perpendicular to both vectors. You got two vectors, their cross product will be perpendicular to both vectors. Now you're looking at this and you're thinking, wait a second, Leach, there are two vectors that are perpendicular to these two vectors. So if I take, my finger and my thumb as the two vectors and find their cross product. There's one poking out of my hand and there's one poking into my hand. So this one down here. What we're gonna find out is that the cross product is not commutative. U cross V is not equal to V cross U. But I've already told you what the difference is. As I've said, if I take U cross, I shouldn't do this. This is like so violent. Welcome to America. Uh, U cross V, one of the vectors is going to point up, and the other vector will point the other direction. The product would be the opposite. So that's exactly it. That's the difference. It's not commutative. U cross V is equal to negative V cross U. It points the other direction. Awesome. We had some vectors yesterday, and I think those will be just as good. So if u is two, that's bad grammar. U r two, negative one, three. Is that what I used? <laughs> Memory worked. Now, if I could only remember what I was going to the store for after work. So 
to calculate the cross product, we just need to calculate the determinant of a three by three matrix. Across the top, we're going to put I, J, and K. In the middle row, we'll put the, the first one listed. Because remember, cross product is not commutative. Uh, no, DET, determinant. So it's debt. Not money like debt. It's like debt for determinant. I guess more of a duck. So the cross product is the determinant of this three by three matrix. So the first row is I, J, and K. The second row is the first vector listed, and the third row is the third vector listed. Everybody remember how to calculate determinants? That's okay. Here's an alternate notation for calculating determinants. So an alternate notation for calculating the determinant of a matrix is just to put the matrix in absolute value. This is going to cause you to read this as absolute value of the matrix, and no one will, and everybody will pretend they don't know what you're talking about, because that's not how you say it. And then you're going to get a whole chorus of um, actually. So just don't do that. Everybody knows what you're talking about. Avoid that by saying the determinant and writing it this way. And if people complain, it's like, well, then you write debt all over the place. We're going to calculate this with cofactor expansion across the first row. So here we are calculating cross product. It's the determinant of this matrix. And we're going to do cofactor expansion across the first row. Ah, yes, of course. Yeah. Um, if you read about Kramer's rule with all the determinants, then yeah, uh, I don't know. How many of you know Kramer's rule? Do you know Kramer's rule? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, Kramer's rule picks it up. Oh, yeah, Kramer's rule does involve determinants. It's uh, Kramer's rule you can use to solve a linear system if you want to take an inordinate amount of time to solve that linear system. If you want to take way too much time to solve your linear system, Kramer's rule is the method for you. There's a reason that you don't know Kramer's rule and y'all do know how to solve a linear system. Kramer's rule is terrible. It's interesting, but kind of terrible for the purpose. It's, it's, it's terrible for its stated purpose. So here's what we do. My first term is going to be my I term. And I got to tell you what a cofactor is. The cofactor for I is this corner down here, negative 1, 4, 3, 1. So the determinant of a 3 by 3 matrix is going to be 3, the sum of 3 determinants of 2 by 2 matrix. The cofactor for J is two zero three one. The cofactor for I was negative one four three one. The cofactor for J two zero three one. The cofactor for K two zero negative one four read as columns. Yes. There is a shortcut for three by three. 
and it is fast. And the faster shortcut is to ask Wolfram Alpha, but uh, we'll get to that one. I like to do the general one first, especially because it's so archaic. So this is the part where you need to make sure you have both sides of your um, of that thing from raising the last on. It's not going to good just burn it into your hand on one side. You need the other side as well because you alternate signs, start positive, but this one has to be negative. See, that's the part where the dude like turns out, ah, but you have to, on the other side, it says to alternate the signs. So that's why they're digging in the wrong place. Yeah. Now we've got to do each of these three cofactors where you do negative one times one minus three times four. So, what's that? Ah, uh, because that's that's the other thing about cofactor expansion. This is you alternate positive, negative, positive. So if I if I did down the first row, it'd be positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative. You got to alternate signs. This. I'm just following the rules for deter for calculated determinant. We don't get to know yet. We're not at that. We're not at that pay level yet. Two times four minus negative one times zero. So this first one we have negative one minus twelve. So negative 13i, uh, 2 minus 0, minus from the cofactor, 2j, and then 8 minus 0. And there's our cross product. Okay. So there is a faster way to calculate the determinant of a three by three matrix, but it's um, it's really for if you have a three by three matrix that's all constants and it's just going to lead to a value. The i, j, and k row in this particular determinant is going to result in a vector like we have here. But if I just had constants up there, like one, two, and three, so if I just had constants up there, then the determinant will give us a real number. And there is a fast way to calculate that real number. We could use that method to calculate the determinant for the cross product, but it will have i, j, and k in all kind of different places. And so we'd have to rearrange and gather like terms. Totally would still work just fine, but there'd be a lot more algebra and it wouldn't just barf out the answer for us at the end. So you are correct. There is a fast shortcut for a three by three determinant and it would work in this case. It's just less efficient in the context of the cross product because we're going for a vector and not just a value. Any questions? Yes. No, this is the this vector is u cross b. It's perpendicular to u and b. Correct. So if we did v cross u, it would take these two rows and switch them around, right? So instead of two times four minus negative one times zero, or to say for i, negative one times one minus three times four. If those are switched, I would be doing four, um, I can't even picture it. I can't do it without writing four, uh, one, negative one, three. It'd be four times three minus one times one, and that would give us positive 13. Because uh, if we have a plane, we can have a normal vector pointing up, or if we change all the signs, it'll point in the opposite direction. It'll be negative one times that direction. Yeah. 
So if I have V pointing to my, my right, then negative V points to my left. And that's what's going on here. We have N pointing up for U cross V pointing up, then V cross U will point down in the, just in the opposite direction. Yes. Um, we'll be imagining the graphs because it's real. Uh, if we if to draw a picture in three D on a flat piece of paper, doesn't illustrate things as well. Now, if I had like, um, if I had like Tony Stark style technology, then I would just have like a plane here, and I would have like a vector pointing through it, and things would explode. And I'd grab things and fling them. And I'd be like, oh, Jarvis, make me a cup of coffee. You don't have that kind of thing. I've had to upgrade I mean, since the MCU came out. I don't want Tom Cruise coming after me. Good question? How's everybody? The important thing is that the cross product of two vectors is going to be perpendicular to both vectors. The reason that we want that this is useful for us, the reason that we're happy to know this, is that we, we know that we can describe a plane with two vectors, or we can describe that same plane as everything perpendicular to one vector, the normal vector. So. This is all good news. Good news. Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm copying stuff down. Um, I'll show you in a second. I'm just making notes because I won't be able to remember all these vectors. So um, uh, as far as the question, uh, what if we have something more than a plane? Think about uh, what, we're, um, what our functions in two variables look like. Our function in, functions in two variables, we graph them as surfaces. So imagine surfaces in three-dimensional space. The calculus, one of the calculus questions for that surface in three-dimensional space, that two-dimensional surface in three-dimensional space, is what's the equation of a plane tangent to that surface at a given point. So imagine there's the surface, we've got a plane that's tangent to the surface at a given point. In a certain sense, we've got one direction describing that surface at that point. And that one direction is the normal. We can describe it with the rate of change of the height of the function with respect to x and with the derivative with respect to y. But if we want one direction, which we often do, we can use the vector normal to the surface. So imagine just you standing up perpendicular to the surface at all the points and all the directions. The reason that we're going to want to do this is we set our vision into the far future, set the Wayback Machine. I don't know if the Wayback Machine goes forward until it's the end of the episode, but let's just multiply the Wayback Machine by, by negative one. Set the Wayback Machine to the end of the semester when we're talking about vector operations. 
we're going to want, want to look at how a vector field is flowing through a surface. A vector field is just assigning a vector to every point. So imagine water flowing through a pipe. And a surface might be a screen that has a certain shape in that pipe. So the water is flowing. We want to know how the water flows through the screen. We care about how much of water, the direction of the water, and also the direction of the screen. So we're going to want one vector to describe that surface, the direction of that surface, rather than a whole plane. If none of that would be clear, that is intentional. It wasn't supposed to be clear. It's not supposed to be clear until later. But we do inception in week three, so that when we get to it in week 12, it makes more sense. And you don't know why, because inception. You know what I mean? I don't know what was so hard about in the movie Inception. It's like, well, you just want to make sure that this guy got an idea. People steal ideas all the time, just casually mention it to them. I mean, this person is supposed to be in charge of an entire company. That dude is used to stealing people's ideas. You just need to have a low-level employee and say, well, this would be a good idea. And then I'll turn. Maybe it will. And then later on, so, so then you just need someone later on to say, that's a great idea, boss. Did you come up with that? It's like, oh, of course I did. I'm the boss. I came up with all the ideas. That's how you do Inception. You don't need fancy machines and to invade people's dreams. I mean, that's just creepy. That's right, Leonardo DiCaprio. Your character is creepy. I don't know if he was supposed to be in that movie, but that movie, that whole movie creeped me out. People just wandering into my dream. So what happens when you see someone in your dreams you don't recognize? That's Leonardo DiCaprio in disguise. All right, well, that's it for cross product. Uh, calculate the dot product between U and U cross V, and it'll come out to zero because the cosine and I be zero. That's gonna do it for this week. I'll be in my office tomorrow from nine to 11 on Zoom and Google. Everybody have a good weekend. And thanks for playing. Not bad about the noise. <laughs>